go ahead and take your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be there in, in just a few moments. Brethren, we are so glad to be with you. It's in this day, and it's just nice to be anywhere outside the house, the way things are with the pandemic and all of that. And it's good to see gospel meetings starting back. We've been looking forward to this. Thank you for, for having us. Um, I'm so glad that John and his family are here with you. They mean a lot to us. Don't tell him I said that. I don't want it to go to his head, but, but he's been a huge influence on me for a long time. Um, I will tell you this. His dad, Gladden, I'd been a Christian, I don't know, uh, a few months. And one Wednesday night after services, Gladden said, I want you to teach Joshua. So he was encouraging me to teach my first class. And I said, okay, who's Joshua? I didn't know if he meant a person or come to find out he meant a book. I didn't know that was a book. I, I didn't know a whole lot. <laughs> but Gladden was in there with me. And he sat, he did an introduction, went through Deuteronomy, kind of got everything set up for the conquest. He gave me some notes that were John's and Brian's. And he sat in there with me for, I don't know, six, eight weeks. And then he didn't come back anymore. And I, he got sick. And, and I said, now, Gladden, you got to get well. you got to come back in. He never came back. So either I did okay or it was a lost cause one. And he just said, I'm just going to go do something else. But that encouragement's always meant a lot to me. And his family has always meant a lot to me as well. So I'm thankful that they're here with you. So Ephesians 4, we'll get there in just a moment. Let me see if I can work this here. There we go. I'm going to start in Exodus chapter 8, and I have the verse up here for you in just a moment. A hardened heart, it's an awful, awful thing. It's, once our hearts get to that point, there's, there's not a whole lot that can be done to, to really pierce that if, if we let it get there. And I think of Pharaoh, and I imagine you do as well. He refused to let Israel go. And you would see these moments where God would do things. He would send those plagues. He would send these warnings. And, and Pharaoh would seem to relent for just a second. But then what would happen? He realized everything was going to be okay. The immediate danger was past. And he'd just go right back to doing what he had always done. This is Exodus 8, 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. This kind of heart doesn't happen overnight. This is something that takes time for that kind of build, bitterness to build up and, and take root in there. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. Bitterness is a feeling of resentment. It can lead to hatred. And sometimes it doesn't take it very long to make that jump there. You remember that Peter warned Simon the sorcerer. And, and I'm actually going to turn there to Acts. And you can as well if you'd like. I keep threatening Ephesians 4, and we'll be there eventually. But you remember Philip the Evangelist goes. He's preaching the gospel there in Samaria, and it's great success. They're responsive to the message there. And then even Simon the sorcerer, who has been sort of putting one over on these guys for a while with his sorceries, he even hears, we're told in verse 13, he obeys he believes and is baptized, verse 13 says. But then verse 18, Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money. And then, of course, verse 23, that didn't sit well with Peter at all. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. So this covetousness, this jealousy over what the apostles had starts working in Simon's heart. And Peter says, you need to stop. You need to repent and fix this right now. This is... This is poisoning you, this bitterness there. So we see it in that part of Acts. I want to look at two verses. This, is, um, this first one is in Hebrews, and then we'll look at one in Deuteronomy. And let me go ahead and say, the context of this is apostasy, falling away from God. But I want us to look at that phrase, root of bitterness, because I think that is a perfect way to describe how bitterness works. Pursue peace with all people. This is Hebrews 12, verse 14. And holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. And a similar passage in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 29, that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. Again, this is being used in a poetic sense to describe falling away, but root that describes how bitterness works. What does a root do? Well, it spreads. 
and it grows and it, it just it gets deeper and deeper and it supports the tree that's going to grow out of it one day if it's allowed to go. Now, Ephesians 4, verse 31. What grows out of a root of bitterness? Ephesians 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Those are the companions of bitterness. That's the kind of stuff that you can expect. If I get that in my heart, these other things are going to come along with it. It's, it's just a matter of time. When we lived in Georgia, we had these little guys all over our front yard, these little pine tree sprigs. They're a nightmare. But if you catch them when they're this size, they're easy to get rid of. You can take two fingers and just flick your wrist and sling these guys right out because their root hasn't taken hold. There's barely, it's just a, just a little bit of a root there. No problem at all. You let them go for a while. <laughs> this picture doesn't do it justice. That is a big tree in that front. I mean, it's, it's massive. I would like to see you whip that out with two fingers. Just walk behind. Just You want this gone? You're going to have to get machinery. I mean, it's going to be a dedicated project. Now, you, and you're going to be busting up all the ground around it. There is so much that's going to have to go in to getting rid of this. Well, that's the way bitterness is, right? If we catch it early, before it has time to sink those roots in, we can pluck it out and we heal and we go on. You let that stuff sit there and it'll grow and it'll grow and it'll plant those roots. And then when you get ready to get it out, it's going to be a project and it's going to be extremely difficult to do then. Let's look at a couple of examples of this. Uh, bitterness, it's a weed in your garden, in my garden. We need to pull it out early. Go to Genesis 4. Let's look at Cain. Cain is an example of bitterness for us. And I know you guys are familiar with this and I love to hear the pages turning. I, my daughter, my oldest daughter gets on to me. She says I move too fast and I go through the PowerPoints too fast and things like that. But take your Bibles, turn and look at these things. Let's, let's look at them together. Cain and Abel both brought sacrifices to God. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. And he rejected Cain's. And the Hebrew writers tells us that Abel's was offered by faith. You see it in uh, Hebrews 11, verse 4, which means that obviously Cain's was not. Well, notice what happens. Uh, verse 5, Cain's very, very angry that God has rejected him. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So when that happens, God warns him that, now look, this is a problem. You let this anger remain. It's going to be a danger. Look at verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? So apparently his whole face changes. I mean, you can just see it. He, he's wearing it on his sleeve, we would say. Verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And it's desirous for you, but you should rule over it. So the idea there is you need to repent, Cain. You've got to pull this stuff out. You've got to get rid of it now. This can't stay. Well, you know what happens. He doesn't get rid of it. And then what, what takes place next? Verse 8. He finds his brother Abel in the field and he slays him there. That bitterness grew and grew to the point that he acted on it. Go to 2 Samuel 13. We'll look at Absalom, David's son. And when you think about Absalom, you think, now how in the world can you get to the point where you would want to kill King David and take the, the kingdom from him? How do you get there where you, his son, would want to do that to him? Well, I, I think we can see. 2 Samuel 13, you're familiar what takes place there. Amnon, the crown prince, the oldest son of David, forces himself on Absalom's full sister, Tamar. Of course, Amnon was her half-brother. So a seed of bitterness gets planted in Absalom's heart. And, and as you go through it, we won't read all of this. I know you guys are familiar with it. But you can almost see that Absalom's holding out hope that David's going to take care of it. He basically tells Tamar, hold your peace. You know, our father is aware of this. Now, this story, a lot of wrongs take place. I mean, let's, let's be fair about that. Amnon was totally unrepentant of what he did. He's just awful toward Tamar. 
David finds out about it. Drop down to uh, verse 21 or so. When King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. Okay, good. Well, you should be. What did David do next? He just stayed angry. He apparently didn't do much of anything. I love David. I love talking about the life of David. But when it came to his kids, a lot of times, he just sort of dragged his feet and didn't address things. And here is one of those times. Amnon has violated the law of Moses. He's violated his own sister. And David basically does nothing about it. What does that do to Absalom? The seed is planted, isn't it? So there it is. But instead of taking this issue and addressing it with David, his father, and his king, Amnon just, or excuse me, Absalom just holds it in. For two years, he just lets that seed grow. And then eventually, of course, he has people murder his brother Amnon. But that murder is not enough to satisfy his bitterness. He flees. You remember he goes to his grandfather in Gesher. He's going to end up hiding there about three years. But he's not done. Eventually, David sends for him to come back. That's all Joab's doing and plotting. But he comes back, and then you remember what David says? He can come back, but he'll never see my face. I don't want to see his face. So if my math is right, seven years have passed since that business happened between Amnon and Tamar. Seven years. You plant the seed back then. What is it now? It's a forest. That thing has grown and grown. And now can we see why this guy would murder his father or try to and take his kid? It makes sense now, right? It started out. It didn't get handled. It grew and it grew and it grew. And now he's willing to do whatever it takes to get what he wants. He's basically had fertilizer dumped on it over all these years. Nothing has done anything to lessen it. So what about us? I mean, I don't, I don't want to be Absalom. I don't want to have that bitterness grow in my heart like that. What do we do and how do we deal with this in our lives? So it usually starts with a feeling of being wronged in some way, uh, maybe being let down, and it starts to grow from there, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, we'll start at verse 23. Obviously, the examples we looked at with Cain and with Absalom, it'll take us places that, that we don't want to go and we never thought we might go. How do we keep from it getting us there? Well, it's always a good idea to follow Jesus' pattern. And it's certainly true with this as well. Matthew chapter 5. Do you notice how Absalom and David's relationship suffered because nothing was done to address the problem? I, as far as I can tell, even after all those years when Absalom came back, they still didn't address the original problem. If they did, we're not told about it. So it was just left out there and it was not handled. What does our Lord say about that? Matthew 5. Let's start there in verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. That is a really powerful statement. Jesus says, don't you dare come to me and act like you're going to worship me and give me these things. And you know fully well you've got something between you and your brother and you could do something about it. Don't even bother coming to me and praying to me and bringing these things. You go handle your business. You go take care of that that's outstanding between you and your brother. Then come back and worship it. That's a powerful statement that he makes. Go to Matthew 18. Jesus again talking about this idea and here talking about how to deal with a personal sin. God wants us to address these problems, not just leave them hanging out there. Matthew 18, I look at verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. We know that the Lord's ways are right, but doesn't it just make good logical sense? Here is a sin between you and your brother, so it's a private sin. Who has to know about it? If you do it this way, if I do it this way, who has to know about it? Nobody, just me and him. And then it's done. If I go to him, 
we deal with it, we, we address it, we take care of it, I forgive him, he forgives me, it's done and nobody else even hears about it. That is not how we normally do it, is it? My brother offends me. I go call like six people and say, can you believe what he did? And so I'm building up these supporters and then it gets out now. What is it? Well, it's not a private sin anymore because I didn't follow the pattern. Now everybody knows about it. But if this is followed, it takes care of that. Well, he should apologize to me. I'm not going to him. Well, what if he doesn't know he offended me? What if I took it the wrong way and the whole thing is a complete misunderstanding? All of these things can be worked out. But sometimes we just say, well, I'm just not going to say anything. So the translation of that is, I'm going to sit here and steam about this for the next 25 years. And every time I look at him, I'm going to shoot daggers through him. But I'm just not going to say anything. It's just like Absalom. It's just building and growing. You think about Jesus and how he's the one that started the reconciliation process with man. What had he done wrong? He was the offended party. He was the one that people had done wrong to. And yet he's the one that went and started the process by which it all could be fixed. You need to learn from his example there. Stop replaying the tapes. And I chuckle about this because... You look out and you see younger people and they're like, what is a tape? What's he talking about? Is he wrapping presents? What, what is that? So before MP3s and, and CDs, there were these wonderful things called cassette tapes. And um, I could bring my truck like Tuesday night. I still have a cassette player in it. So if you've never seen one, it works and you can see it. But you listen to your music and then when you get to the end of the song, you had to rewind it. And then you listen to it again and you play it over and over if you, if you like the song or whatever. This is what we do when we're offended sometimes, isn't it? That conversation that upset me so much, what do I do for like the next 10 days? I just I think through it in my mind. And then I go back, I rewind it, and I play through it again. And what starts happening is I add things to it. Things that didn't offend me at first, all of a sudden they did. They do now. Oh, you know what? She said this too. Oh, I bet she meant it that way. And now all of a sudden, we're just going through and playing it and adding all of these other things. We give Satan room to work. He loves it. It makes it easy for him. Don't nurse a grudge. When you have an injury, you need to take care of it. You nurse it. You, you give it a lot of attention. Don't do that with a grudge. The last thing a grudge needs is more attention and, and needs help to get bigger and stronger. This takes a lot of self-control, and it takes a lot of honesty. Do I constantly think about how I was wrong? I need to snatch it out while it's still young. Before I let it, before I start replaying those tapes, before I let it grow into this big tree, I need to go ahead and get rid of it early and remove it there. Turn back to Ephesians 4. Same place. We'll look one verse low. And while you're turning there, I will say this. We may think, I don't think I have any bitterness in there. One way we can tell is looking at those who are close to us. If, um, if I start hearing my kids say things that are just really full of bitterness, you know, they got that from somewhere. And it's a good indication that maybe, maybe I'm giving off some vibes and they're quick to pick up on that. I might be sowing the seeds of bitterness in somebody else's garden than my own. This may be something that's spreading through my own family. So obviously a warning for us there. Take a look at Ephesians 4, verse 32. If these traits describe us, it's going to be a lot harder for bitterness to take root. Verse 32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. <clears throat> Pray for the one who has wronged you. You can stay there. I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 5. It is extremely difficult to be bitter towards somebody if you are truly and honestly praying for their good. I'll give you an example. I'm sorry to say it, but it, it's a true example. So six, seven years ago, we were in Georgia 
and a man came to the congregation there and began teaching false doctrine. And a number of the guys tried to go to him, and we just tried to talk to him about it. He was so condescending and belittling toward the men who did that, and he would just, just smirk as he said things. Guys, I will tell you, it got to the point that when I saw him walk in the double doors in the back, my blood pressure shot up. I could not look at him without almost trembling with anger. It was so, so much bitterness in me. It got to the point, I was replaying the tapes. Any conversation we had had, I just played them over and I thought about it. I would be outside cutting grass with my weed eater and I was just, just, just thinking about it. I mean, I just couldn't get away from it. I was so mad. And then I was studying in Matthew 5. And I got down to verse 43 or so. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. And I thought, I'm sorry. And I started praying for this guy. Father, I want him to go to heaven. Please let things fall into place where he will. Help me not to be this way toward him. And it was like a thousand pounds just lifted off my shoulders. Now, he was still wrong, okay? What he was teaching was wrong. But can we rebuke somebody and stand against false doctrine without hating them? Yeah, we can did Jesus rebuke false doctrine without hating people? Well, sure he did. And this is, this is the thing. Satan will use our zeal. It's good to be zealous, isn't it? I mean, it's good to, to want right to be done and to, to hate wrong. But you've got to be careful. Because that zeal, it's like gasoline, man. It, and you let that fire get out of control, it'll just burn all over. Make sure it doesn't take us to bitterness and wrath. Go back to Ephesians 4. I want us to do something. If I want to know if bitterness has taken hold, look at these two verses. We read the first one. And they're in 32. Now go back to 31, which we read earlier. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Which one of those honestly describes my heart? If, if I'm... If I have an issue with someone, what, how could I describe my heart? Is it bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor when I think about them, and evil speaking? Or is it kindness and tenderhearted and a willingness to forgive? Answering that honestly will tell me if that bitterness has set in in my heart. Remember good examples. We looked at some bad ones earlier. Let's, let's look at two good ones. Obviously, our Lord is the best. You think about all the evil that Jesus endured. He was innocent of it all, and yet they brought it on him. And then at the very end, you, you just have this picture. You, you've got these Roman soldiers that are casting lots for his garments there. And what does he say? While they're doing that, I mean, they clearly couldn't care less about his situation. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. There is a heart that has no bitterness. No guile. And we may say, though, yeah, but that's Jesus. He's deity. Yeah, I can't do that, but I can. And we know that because we have the example of men like Joseph who did that. You remember Joseph, horribly mistreated by his brothers. They, they wanted to just outright kill him, but Reuben wouldn't let him. So then they said, we'll just throw him in a pit. We'll sell him to some Midianite traders. You remember what happens then. And, Around Genesis 37 or so, he ends up going to Egypt. He's in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. He gets thrown in prison for that. Boy, there's a chance to be bitter, isn't it? Man, what have I done? I've been trying to do right this whole time, and here I am. But, of course, God works it out. And Joseph understood God had never forsaken him. His brothers mistreated him. Yeah, sure they did. And Potiphar was wrong about him. But God had never forsaken him the entire time. And Joseph understood it. But you remember at the end of his life, when their father dies, of course the brothers come and the family's there in Egypt. Joseph is in a position of power. You remember his brother's attitude when their dad dies? We're in trouble now. 
There's nobody here to save us. I mean, Joseph is going, he's going to take back all of that. He's going to take it back on us. And his answer to him, he's hurt that they would think that. He says, now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. He loved them. He hadn't let bitterness. He knew that this was God's plan. He knew that it worked out for the best. I need to remember good examples like these. Well, avoiding bitterness, it doesn't happen by luck. It's not, well, you either got it or you don't. This is something that we will make a conscious decision about every day. And every time we're faced with it, we make the conscious decision if we're going to let that bitterness creep in. All right, last time. Uh, you don't ever have to see this picture, this slide again. But here it is one last time. Pull it out when it's a sprig, right? When it first starts, when you feel that coming in and starting, just go ahead and get rid of it so you don't have to deal with the monster that grows out of it. Has bitterness crept into your heart? Here's a couple ways that we can tell. Can you not even look at somebody without your blood pressure going up? That's a good indication that some bitterness has crept in. If I hear someone's name mentioned, does it just make me mad? Or I hear somebody's voice over there and it just grates on my nerves. That's a good chance that something's wrong. Or if I hear somebody saying good about someone else, do I have to interrupt and set them straight? You know, that Lance, he's not a bad guy. Well, you just don't know him like I do. <laughs> if those things are true of me, it's, it's probably more than a sprig now. I need to get it out before it goes any further. Remember Peter's advice to Simon. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. I need to understand our society, bitterness and snarkiness is, is, is funny and it's accepted and all that stuff and it's just expected. It's wickedness is what it is. And it'll ruin me if I allow it to stay there. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness. Pray, God, that the thought of your heart may be forgiven. Go ahead and get your songbooks out. Is this true of us? Have we allowed something, some issue with someone to come in and it's just started to grow? I mean, it's gotten worse and it's affected the way we think about them. We need to take care of it this morning, don't we? There may be someone who needs to respond. There may be someone who needs to obey the gospel. And we hope that you'll consider that. We talk about wronging people. We haven't wronged anybody as much as we've wronged our Lord. We need to make things right with Him. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God, deity, who came to be a sacrifice. You're willing to confess that, to repent, even as Peter's advice was, to turn away from those sins, to be baptized into Christ, to have those sins washed away, and strive to live faithfully for the rest of your life. If you're willing to do that this morning, you can. You can be baptized, become a child of His, and begin that new life. Maybe we need the prayers of the saints. Maybe we just need some help, and sometimes we do. You can do that this morning as well. Please come as we stand and sing. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel, and in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up, and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's Word, helpful to you in your journey toward God, and if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.